This is the formula that used to be used by the ancient Hebrews when two tribes or two peoples came together to cut a covenant they would go through some specific steps. What I want to do is go through these nine steps with you as they would and I know it's going to open your mind even before we get to the Bible. Okay. Then, when we've done this, we are going to see what God did, because God took these same nine steps, exactly the same ones. And so we're going to then, later, trace the blood covenant with Adam, which was with a man. The second covenant, which was also a blood, was with Noah, which was with a family. The next covenant, the third one, was with Abraham, which was a tribe. The next covenant was with Moses, which was a nation. The other covenant with Jesus is with the world. Okay? And so that's the process of the covenant. But Jesus took these nine steps, God takes these nine steps, and that's what the day is going to trace up to the final sacrifice. Yeah? So here are the nine steps that they would take. I'm going to list them off, and then we, uh, we will actually try and demonstrate them. Now, I don't know how the camera will work, but I will have somebody here, and we'll try to use your imagination and have somebody here with me. I'll probably pick on Sean because he's ten times bigger than me. Okay, Not just yet. I'll call you up. Okay, um, But let's see what it is first. Okay, okay. two tribes are coming together. Now, before, as we start, I want you to imagine you've got... People gathered, two tribes. They are going to cut a covenant. They're going to become kind of one tribe. So the kings or the, the chieftains of that tribe or their representative are going to represent the tribe. You do not come to a covenant ceremony in your you know, beach bathers. You wear your best everything, best armor, Best clothes, best, absolutely best everything. Anything less than that is an insult. Okay? And then the two tribes or the two peoples witness these nine steps. Okay? And then the covenant becomes complete and then we'll see what happens. So the first thing that's going to happen is, in this case, I'm going to use Sean. Sean represents the... Um, the um, What's your surname? Lennon. Lennon. The Lennon tribe, and I represent the Russell tribe. Okay? So we're in this, in a minute, we're going to come together, and we're going to, I want you to see what happens to his family and my family. Okay? Our tribes. So the first thing we're going to do is, no, step one. They take off their coat or their robe. They wouldn't have a coat necessarily in those days. It would be a robe. Okay? And then they exchange that. Then number two, they take off their belt, they exchange them. Number three, they actually cut the covenant. Number four, they raise their right arms and mix the blood. Number five, they exchange names. Number six, they make a scar. Number seven, they give the covenant terms. Number eight, they eat a memorial meal. And number nine, they plant a memorial tree. Please don't interrupt if you... I can't understand you over there, okay? Um, those are the nine steps, okay? I'm going to take each one now through. And if we can see what's going on, you will get an insight to the Bible and to your faith, okay? So let us try that. Now, what I'm going to do is going to ask Sean to come up here. I don't know how your camera angle will go. 
we're going to be pointing to the floor at some point. And uh, so what's going to happen? I want you to imagine. Okay? Now this is going to be almost like a contradiction considering his size. But I want you to imagine that sh the Lenin tribe are weak. <laughs> He's disagreeing already, isn't it? They're total wimps, right? Okay. And they're very poor. They have a small army. They've got very little support from anybody. And what happens is the Philistines go on Lenin days. They go hunting around for the Lenin to beat them. So he becomes a professional smitten from the smiters. So everybody picks on him, okay? So because he's such a little tribe, he doesn't have, even he's big in size, but he doesn't have much else, okay? But I, on the other hand, me, oh man, I have got the biggest army. I have got the most wealth. I have the most power. I've got everything. I am the big dude, yeah? Now, he's wearing kind of like scruffy little robes because that's the best he can afford. So they're probably all tattered, right? But mine is purple, you know, and it's got all the wonderful regalia on. I've got solid gold, everything. My armor shines, my sword, which I was going to bring today. I have swords, right? It's all glistening. and well. His is rusty, okay? A rusty old sword. It's the best he's got. He's polished it up for a bit to get to the ceremony, but... You know, so imagine the difference, the contrast, okay? But I want you to watch what happens with that. So here he is, he's in rags, okay? He's very poor, he's got no defense, he's got not got much, he's got rusty armor, you know, blunt swords. I've got just about everything you can imagine, you know, everything glorious, okay? All right, now. So the first thing that Sean and myself are going to do as your witnesses is... We come with our best robes, our best everything. So he is wearing a robe. I am wearing my robe. Now, my robe is purple velvet. His is, you know, cheap, whatever, okay? Now, I want you to watch what happens. So the first thing we are going to do is he is going to take off his robe, okay? Now, I take off my robe. I give my robe to him. And he gives his to me. So he puts on my robe, and I put on his. Is your attitude going to change towards him now? Yes. You see? See what's happening here? Okay. Why? The robe represents the person. In giving him my robe, I am sy symbolically saying to Sean, Sean, I am giving to you my whole self. I am giving to you my total being. I am giving you my life, which I now pledge to you. And you hear, that's what the robe means. The robe represents my position. It's my standing in the community. It is also called the robe of righteousness. Okay? In other words, when I wear that robe, you know who you're talking to. When I put it on him, there is a change in his persona and the way people look at him. This covenant is also called the covenant of strong friendship, and it's also called the great exchange. This is what God has done with you. Okay? This is what he's done. If you look at Philippians 4, okay? he's laid down his Godhead. Okay? So now he is wearing that. So this robe represents standing in the community. It represents the person as a person, their life and everything that they stand for. And it's a pledge and it's exchanged. So he is taking on a new creature. I am taking on him. You understand? I am exchanging my standing for his. I am exchanging my wealth for his poverty. Okay? All right. Step two. We now come to the belt, which he's not wearing. So he has a belt by faith. I actually have one. The belt is not to hold your trousers up. The belt has, if you look even in modern warfare, 
you, the belt has the ammunition, the water bottle, the bayonet, all this stuff is all on the belt. In the ancient area, you'll have the sword, the dagger. So the belt has these functions of carrying your weapons and also for holding your armor together. Okay? So what he will now do is uh, I take off my belt and I hold it up. He takes off his belt, he holds it up. Um, so I am symbolically now saying to Sean, Sean, I am giving to you all of my strength. I'm giving to you all of my army. I'm giving you my strength. I'm pledging to you all of my support and my protection. And so I hand the belt to him, and in doing this, I'm saying to him, here is all of my strength. This is all of my ability to fight. If anyone attacks you, then they're attacking me. Your battles are now my battles, and mine are now yours. I will fight with you, and I will defend you, and I will protect you. So he takes the belt, he puts it on, I take his belt and put his on. Now here's an interesting thing, you hear what I've said. I am the most powerful king. I have the biggest army. Everybody submits to me. No one submits to him. He's a puny little band that everybody picks on. I have just pledged to him all of my armed forces, all of my resources of battle and war that are now belonging to him. So let's say I have, say, 500,000 men at arms, and he's got 500. He now has 500,500, isn't it? Right? Men at arms. I have the same, because I've got his as well as mine. Okay? So there's a multiplication. So again, he is now wearing my shiny sword. <laughs> you see? It's gold, or whatever it's made of. He's now wearing my robe and that. Do you think, then, my army would listen to him? Yes. So I've given him commandership over what I have command over. Yes? Okay. So we can fledge this out a whole lot as to what this means. If God has done this to you, then all the armies of heaven are on your side. How many armies have you got? None. Okay, but God has done this. So that's where we get this from. Number three, we actually cut the covenant. Now, this is where it gets interesting. <coughs> By taking an animal and splitting it down the middle, that's what we do. Okay? Because in biblical terms, only an animal is used. Because human sacrifice is forbidden. Okay? So by taking an animal, and it usually has to be one of the best, okay, it's got to be top class animal. It's brought in and it is slaughtered. It is split down the middle. It is only ever split down the middle in a blood covenant ceremony. Any other time it may have the throat cut for food, but in this one it's split down the middle. So when you see that, you know there's a blood covenant coming into effect. Um, and so here we, now we bring in this animal and it's split. What happens? Blood flows. Right. You're cutting where blood flows. So the blood of the animal now flows. Okay? Now, we, we, with the split animal, we have one side either side of us. So the animal is in between us. Okay? The blood is flowing everywhere. Everybody's witnessing this. He is now wearing my robe and everything else. And now the animal is split. The blood flows. Now, the next thing we do is, because the uh, one half is that side, one half is that side, we now step into the blood. Okay, so it's very gory, okay? But you're not going to forget this, right? 
Okay. So we and I now we step into the dead animal. So we're standing between the two carcasses in the blood. Okay? Now we're going to go through this a couple of times to tell the big picture. When we are in together, we turn our backs to each other. We're in the animal, then we walk out from the animal and turn around and come back. Okay, so let's walk out. All right, we're out of the animal, now we turn around and we come back into the animal. That is a figure eight. It's called the figure eight walk. It's the covenant walk. So we've come back into the carcass facing each other. Okay? Um, so in doing this process, we are saying several things. This is what we are saying together. Okay, we'll do it from my perspective. What I'm doing with Sean as this powerful king is I am saying that by this animal being slaughtered that we are dying to ourselves. The animal represents us. The two halves represent us. The blood and the sacrifice says I am dying to myself. I'm giving up all of my rights to my own life. And I'm beginning a brand new walk, a brand new life with my covenant partner unto death. Should I repeat that? Okay, right. When we cut the animal and we do this walk, we are saying to each other, I'm saying to Sean, Sean Lennon, I, Edward Russell, am dying to myself. I am giving up all of my rights to my own life and I'm beginning a brand new life with you as my covenant partner unto death. Very strong, isn't it? We're standing in blood saying this because that represents me. Now, the next thing we're saying because, you see, the two halves of the animal represents us. Okay? So, as we walk through, you know, he's saying the same thing to me, you see, but as we're walking through the animal, okay, we are pointing down to the animal. So, I want to try that, just do it slowly, and I will verbalize what we're doing in the carcass, okay? So, we are now standing back to each other, okay? Now, what we're going to do is walk out and then come back again, Sean, okay? All right. Now, let me just hang on when I say go. Okay. He's keen to cut this covenant, isn't he? Oh. All right. As we're walking out and through the covenant, we're pointing to the dead carcass. Okay, you ready? So let's go out. We're pointing down, and what we're saying, I'm saying to him, Sean, we're pointing to the dead animal. May God do this to me. Okay? And even more, if I ever try to break this covenant with you. You split me down the middle and feed me to the vultures if I break this most sacred contract. You hear what's being said? There's the promise. You do this to me if I break this. May God do this to me. You split me down the middle, feed me to the vultures even if I try to break this. How strong is this? Very strong, isn't it? Okay? So you don't enter into a covenant lightly. You want to break the rules, <laughs> you can end up a dead carcass, right? Okay, and come back in the picture here. Okay? While we're still standing in the blood. Now again, let me just say that there. You see, what we're doing here, that I mentioned earlier, what we have in our society is a remnant of this knowledge. Because when we do contracts, and this is where they come from. Now, when we are talking about having a, you know, a covenant with God, consider this. <laughs> it's no small matter. You can't take this like, oh, well, you know, he won't mind. He won't mind if I break a little bit of the covenant. Will he? Yes, he will. Because, you see, if I've broken this, I have betrayed him. He has a moral obligation to split me down the middle. Moral obligation. He's not a savage. <laughs> He's an honorable man if I break this. Does that make sense? All right. So now we're standing in. I'll have to use 
I don't know, because this is going to be in front of my face. Okay. Now we raise our right arms. This is step four. We're standing in the blood. We point it to the carcass. We raise our right arms. So he takes out a knife from his belt and cuts the palm. What happens? Blood flows. Good. All right. So you can see now a covenant is coming into effect. Okay. So you can see the blood of the animal. Now you can see our blood. Okay. And so it is at this point that we join our hands together. Now I want you to watch something that's left in our society from this. You ready? Yes. Now you'll see that at the wedding. Yes? Now when you go to the wedding and you've got... Okay, all that business, all right? This is because, remember, the wedding ring wouldn't be gold, it would be a cut. Blood would be intermingling. And then you speak the promises of the wedding, which all comes from this ceremony. Okay, so that's where that comes from. Now, while we're holding hands like that, we're shaking hands, or, what you call it, or we could do it this way. You see in that one? Dude. Okay. All right. So you got that, and you got that, and you got that. All from blood covenants, all right? So we're here standing in the blood. Our blood is joining together. Our blood is now intermingling. This is where we swear allegiance to each other. Okay? Uh, we are now, by this means, becoming one life. So again, in the wedding, when it was done originally with blood, and that's where you swear, you, you know, I promise to be with you, blah, 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 you're becoming one life. It's the blood is intermingling. The consummation happens later, but this is where it happens at the covenant time. Okay? But then you have a more meal, but we'll come to that. Okay. So we're becoming one life because the blood is our life. Um, we are putting off the old nature and we're putting on the new nature of the blood covenant partner. We're becoming one. So in other words, I am taking off me and taking on him. Does that make sense? You can see that happening. Okay. So whilst we're in the blood, we've cut our hands, we're intermingling, now it's time to do the next step. Because it's at this point that we are now beginning to bring in the terms of this covenant. Okay? So again, you know, just to remind you, this is where we get the handshake. We've got a deal. That's where it comes from. We've got the terms. We've agreed. We've come to an agreement. Shake hands. It's sealed. Getting back to seal with blood, the other thing from the last session, was once you have a seal on the envelope, there is a seal in your Catholic faith. Do you know what it is? It's the Holy Spirit. Where does that happen? No, no. Confirmation. Yes. Confirmation is the seal of the blood. You're sealed against the day of redemption. So it cannot be broken. <laughs> You're sealed. Only the king can open it. Or you can break it, but no one else can touch it. You're under protection of the blood. That's what blood protection is from that. Okay? So, next step, five. We exchange names. Now, where else have you heard that? In marriage, good. Or when you join a religious order. Okay? In other words, when you become a brand new creature, you take on a brand new name. You're born again. You become something new. Okay? So we now uh, uh, are holding our hands, we're in the blood, and we exchange names. The blood is intermingling. So I take, for example, Sean's last name into my name. And he takes my last name into his name. Okay? So, in effect, literally that way, it would mean that he now becomes Sean Lennon Russell. <coughs> or I might become Russell, uh, sorry, Edward Russell Lennon or Lennon Russell. Okay? We just decide which is first. But that's where you get double battled names. In the marriage ceremony, you usually only take one. Okay? But that's where it comes from, is the exchange of names. Um, now, it's interesting about names because we have in our... Okay, biblical history shows that if someone takes a name, it is not just a title to name somebody by. It actually represents their mission. For example... Before Peter was Peter, Petra, he was Simon. But when the revelation that he was the Christ came, he began a new 
relationship, he became Peter. Same happened with Saul as Paul. And so it goes on. So when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, you shall name him Emmanuel, or you name him Jesus, it says, he is God who saves. That's his mission. So when the mission changed in our lives, then the new name was given, because a new persona was there. Okay? In our European culture, um, names are ba basically made up of two areas, Christian name and surname. To get rid of Jesus in our society now, it's called given name. Okay? That's to get rid of Christ. Okay? So the Antichrist world. All right? So it's now called given name. I say no, it's my Christian name. Thank you. Because I know what my covenant is. Covenant is, right? So I have... Okay, let me explain. Way back in history, round about the time of King Arthur and places like that, okay? The lord of the land owned the land, owned the manor, the lord of the manor owned the land, and all the people worked on it worked for him. They were called serfs, or serpents, okay? That's serfs. They work for the baron, they work for the earl, whoever owns the land, and they're owned by him. He provides them for the work with everything they need. So you have the village and all that sort of stuff all on the property. But he owns them. So the serf has a serf's name. And the name is related to their occupation. For example, smith. The smith could be a blacksmith or some other smith. The smith, the work of the smith. So he would be known as the smith, or the blacksmith. So that was his serf's name related to his occupation. If he made barrels for the, uh, for the wine or whatever, he would be called the cooper. Okay? And so it goes on. So you have the names come from the origin. For instance, if he was cooking the food and making the bread, he would be called the baker. So that was the serf's name. Okay? So you can follow that through and see. That's all they had. When Christianity came, they came into a new covenant, they were born again, and then they took on a Christian name. Okay? Because of this exchange. So then, for example, uh, you get the Smith. He would now become a Christian. He would now take on a Christian name, and he would pick the uh, John from John's Gospel. So he'd now be known as John the Smith. That was then shortened to John Smith. So you had, so the word surname comes from serf's name. Okay? Right? But the first name, the given name, so called, is the Christian name that you chose when you accepted Christ. So you become a new creature. Does that make sense? So that's the origin of, of that that we have in our culture. Right? Now, other cultures may have similar things. I'm not too sure of Asian cultures, ultimately, of how they work that. But largely in the European, Northern European, that is what that origin is. Okay? Make sense? Enlighten you a little bit? Interesting, isn't it? Okay. So, in this case, what happens is I take on Lennon and he takes on Russell. Okay? So, we're becoming a kind of new family, right? We're becoming one. So that happened in your marriage, okay? Uh, so you have maiden name and then you have married name. I don't understand, actually I'm not too sure why there's only one name in the exchange. I'm not sure of that. But it might make some sense when we understand St. Paul's teaching on women. Because Paul is not a male chauvinist pig. Okay? He actually liber Jesus liberated women. Germain Greer and the feminists to put you back in bondage. But that may come up at some point and I will kick that out of your picture. Get rid of your Catholic feminism. Because it leads to Catholic little small groups of about 12 people meeting together, which are actually called covens. We'll get to that another time. Am I in trouble yet? <laughs> no, okay, not yet. Okay. Not yet, oh, thanks very much. Not yet, right, okay. 
All right, let's get stay on our track here. Okay, so we've changed names. <clears throat> now we're still holding our hands together. We're in the blood. The animals are there. We've, we've said that. Now we've exchanged names. Now it's time to make a scar. How are we going to do that? Well, we're not going to do this literal because it gets a bit sore. What we're going to do, we've got, notice we've got a big cut on the palm of the hand. So we've got our hands together. We're not going to do it this way, but you press very hard and you rub your hands together. See, we're pressing like that. Can you imagine you have a deep cut? What is going to happen when you do that? Apart from hurting. You're going to remember this covenant, right? It's open up. The flesh is going to peel back. Now that means it's going to leave a mighty scar. Because if I just do a small cut, it heals. It just looks like one of the marks on my palm. But if I open the flesh up, I may even put a tattoo mark in there. Okay? That's what a lot of tattoos come from, is actually covenant marks. So that may happen so it can be clearly seen. Okay? Now, so we make a scar. The blood is joining together. We make the scar. Now the scar becomes a permanent testimony to the covenant. It is the scar that bears witness to the covenant. I want to keep that. The scar bears witness to this covenant. Okay? And it will be a permanent unmovable reminder of our covenant responsibilities and therefore a guarantee and seal of the covenant. So if you put that back to the wedding ring, you can see what I mean. This one cannot be peeled off. Okay? It was painfully put on. It was clearly seen in a gory situation. And you cannot hide it. Okay? So... Let us suppose now, we've finished the rest of the covenant, but let's suppose on this one to get an understanding of the meaning of this scar. Let us suppose the covenant ritual is all finished. And off goes Sean. He doesn't need to wear all this regalia anymore, so he's back in his everyday, let's go for a little ride to the Sinai Desert clothes, okay? So off he goes, he's on his own going along on his camel or whatever he's decided to ride that day, and the thumper tights come. These are the people who like thumping shorns. Okay? So their profession in life is to actually smite. And they are smiters from way back. They can be philatine smiters. But they go, ah, there is a Lenonite. Let's thump them. Let's smite a Lenonite today. So we all open season on Lenonites. Now, he's on his own. What do you think he might do? So you've got 200 um, guys going to beat him up, right? 200 Philistines are going to pick on him. What do you think he might do? What would you do, Sean? Oh, good. Okay, now this is interesting. What are you going to do? Are you just going to go like that? Which way would you think you would do it? Right. Have you seen this sign before? St stop! Good! Glad you're getting the message, because when you have a policeman step out into busy traffic, who's only my size, and there's a you know 60-ton Mack truck coming down at 70 kilometers an hour, and he stands out there and goes, "Stop in the name of the law." Does he have any power, strength in his body to stop a truck? No way. Does it stop? Hopefully, it does. Okay, the traffic comes to a grinding halt. Why? Well, the last, he, you see, because of the robe. What's the robe? It's where he's wearing his, his insignia that tells you what he is, and he's standing in the community. The arm in the air says, I have authority backing me up, like he's saying. So I'm saying, in the name of the law, stop. But if you disobey me, you disobey every citizen of the country. You disobey the law. So the strength of that policeman is not in his personal strength. It's in the strength of his covenant and place and standing in the community. So when he comes along to these bunch of Philistines, who don't care about that anyway, and puts his hand in the air, he's not just saying stop. What he's saying is, here is my scar. They know what that means. He has a covenant. 
But they can't see his covenant partner. So they don't know how big he is, do they? They don't know who he is. They know he's got one. They don't know who they're dealing with. They do know if they hurt him, they've got to fight his covenant partner. Because the covenant partner said, I will defend you. They know that. Now let's suppose you were the Philistines. And you are going to attack him. What would you do if he showed you that scar? Figure out who the partner is. Well, you probably would. I'm talking them. <laughs> if you were wise, what would you do? Well, if you really want to fight, you might want to do that. You just want to start a war. Fine, you're going to do that. You're going to do that because you say, okay, let's work out his partners, then we'll kill them as well. Duh. Okay, this is more practical than that at this stage. He's going to be attacked on his own. He holds up a scar. You're not really looking for war. You're looking to beat him up. Okay? What are you going to do? You're going to back off. Yes, you are. Because you could be dealing with an army 10,000 times bigger than you. You're not going to take the risk. You don't know who they are. You are going to back off. So the scar protects him. So when this covenant is held up, it can clearly be seen, they must bow. When you lift up the name of Jesus, the enemy bows. Okay? Does that make sense? Can you see it? Okay. So the scar testifies to the covenant. Now, Sean, I'm going to ask you to sit down for your sake now, because I'm going to spread this out a little titch. And give you some, and I'm going to call you back. I just don't, just want you standing there while I'm doing this, you see. He needs a rest, he's been working hard with all this covenanting he does. Mind you, I've often wondered, um, what happens if you went into covenant with about ten tribes? Okay. Well, let's not go down that track just yet, let's get, alright? Alright. How strong is all of this? Well, okay. I won't tell you about spider, um, but it, it suffice it to say that as far as I remember from 1994, after saving the life of a guy that was a member of the Hells Angels um, and got him to a safe place, we were told, you have a problem, call this number, we'll have all of these people on your side because it was a covenant situation. So in that sense, we came under that protection because of saving his life there's a life owed to us. So that was an interesting situation. But I won't go into too much of that. But what I will talk about is something that I witnessed in Africa. Now, in Uganda, where I go, because I haven't been to any other countries in Africa, but I've been to Uganda. There are nine languages in Uganda because there are nine kingdoms. Now, the nine kingdoms is what it really is. When the British went and everybody did their bit, they decided to reorganize them in a different way and make it one country. So you have nine different languages and nine kings. Okay? <laughs> so there's a lot of covenanting going on <laughs> if you're going to make it work. When I began and I taught on this, uh, did this whole session in a place called Kasese, which is on the Congo border, about 10 kilometers from the Congo, which is way out in the bush. This is where we're, you know, you've got elephants crossing the road area, that kind of stuff, and roaming lions and all that sort of thing, okay? So we're teaching on blood covenants. But you know, every time I taught it in Africa, they understood it. Click. Because when I mentioned, have you heard of Stanley and Livingstone? Have you heard that? You heard the term, ah, Dr. Livingstone, I presume? Right, you've heard that. All right. Education for those who are shaking, affirmation for those who are nodding. Okay? So the story, true story of Stanley and Livingstone is that uh, in the turn of the centuries when Africa was deep, dark Africa, and all the animals were wild and killed you, so we had an excuse to slaughter them so we could look big white hunter, which is all a lot of crock. Okay? I've taken photographs of lions that far away, but only after they've killed a buffalo. Yeah, right, so, okay. <laughs> All right? So we had, we, we, they, they put on a false perception of Africa 
which is why we felt the right to slaughter and pillage and rape the place. Okay? However, they knew about Stanley and Livingstone. Now, what had happened was Dr. Livingstone went into deep, dark Africa and got lost somewhere. So Stanley, his best friend, went to search for him. By the way, I can tell you, if you've not been to Africa, it's not dark. It's actually very beautiful. It's not dark Africa. Okay, so he's going looking for him. Now, Stanley uh, had a problem with his stomach. Okay, I don't know what the problem was, a gastric problem, but the only thing stopping him from dying of this gastric problem was goat's milk. So he had to have regular goat's milk daily. Okay? So when he went to Africa to seek Dr. Livingstone, he had to take a herd, little herd of goats with him to supply his goat's milk on the journey. So Stanley goes through Africa. He cuts numerous covenants. And this is what happens, because you go back to your movies, you know, Jungle Jim or whatever it might be back then, and then you get the, you know, the big white hunters, they go marching off and they've got their African slaves carrying all their stuff, and they're, you know, doing the nice thing with their pith helmets and things like that, looking all very uh, pit pips, and uh, all that junk. And, uh, and then they come to a village, and all the savages, because they're savages, because they don't wear pith helmets. Um, I said to my friend while I was there, because you know, the poverty in Uganda as well as other places, I said, you know, you weren't poor till we came. You hmm. Attention. I said, yes, you weren't poor till we came. There was nothing poor about your culture. You fed well, you dressed well, you had gold, you had silver, you had all these riches, which we took off you for plastic beads. And then we told you that instead of running around naked, because that's dirty and rude, you've got to wear clothes. So now you've got to buy Levi's, and you can't afford them, so you're poor. You need a television, you need a phone, you need a house, so you're poor. Your poverty does not come from your country, it comes from ours, because you can't afford it. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we used to run around naked and we didn't sin either. I said, absolutely right. And I'm the only one that understands that. <laughs> okay? <laughs> one few people you know that understands that. So that poverty came. Let's just put, throw that in for their sake. Okay? But you've got Stanley going through. So he comes to this village and they're all doing their African thing. But then you might picture that they have a big party. Then they exchange things. So, you know, they will, you know the white hunter will bring out the plastic beads or whatever they brought with them, and exchange it for gold and pearl, well not pearls, we wouldn't dig them out of the ground. But you know what I mean? You've seen it happen. But what you're seeing there is the exchange of gifts, which we will come to in the covenant ritual. They are coming into a covenant. Because when Stanley goes into an area, of a tribal owned area, he has no legal rights to be there, and as a trespasser, and as a trespasser, must die. Okay? So the only way to get through is to come into a covenant with the chief to come under his protection so that you can travel safely in his territory. Does that make sense? Any country is the same. It's called a visa. Right? All right. So that's what he would do. So he cut numerous, uh, I don't know whether I wrote down how many covenants Stanley actually cut all the way through Africa. Um, yeah, 50. He cut at least 50 covenants to get through Africa to find uh, Dr. Livingstone, okay? Now, this was all very good until he came to a certain area and the chief of that area was one of the big dudes. He was of the Russell tribe, okay? And, of course, you've got to give the best in a covenant exchange. So Stanley goes through the ritual again. They have their dance in the part, and it goes on, which is a remnant of this, and you'll see even through the steps that they did the same thing, even though they hadn't read the Bible. Okay? And so he it comes to the time for the exchange of gifts. So the chief wants, guess what? Goats. Now, Stanley is not going to live 
he's going to die if he doesn't have the goat's milk. So if he gives his goats to this chief in exchange for whatever he gives him, he's going to die. But what is going to happen if he doesn't give it? He's going to die. <laughs> okay? If he does not give this chief what is right in this covenant, he dies. But if he does give it, he dies because he doesn't have the milk. So Stanley gave the chief all the goats. The chief gave him, in return, a piece of wood, a stick. I was going to bring one today, just to give it to me. I forgot it this morning. It's about this long, just a stick. And it's got some copper wire wrapped around it or something. It doesn't look much, okay? And that's what he gives him. Okay, they have the party, and off goes Stanley. No goats. So now they're protected through that area under this king, and then they move into one or the other. They move into another area. But this particular tribe do not want a covenant. They're not interested. We don't want you here. And so they attack Stanley and his entourage. And so, you know, you've got the guns going off and the usual, you know, the fight you might see in the movies. And then, you know, the last one, I don't know why everybody drops their weapon. But anyway, when you run out of bullets, you throw the gun, that type of thing, you know what I mean? No, why don't you do that? You might need that. Anyway, just because you run out of bullets doesn't mean it's no good. Okay. Um, anyway, that's Hollywood for you. But nevertheless, so he's got to a stage where they are not... The last resort is that he falls to the ground. There's a warrior coming at him with a spear. His gun is empty. He's flayed on the floor. And he sees this stick lying there, which this chief had given him. So he reaches out to get it to hit this warrior. So he lifts it up into the air to strike the warrior. Immediately, that warrior drops the stick and bows to him. And every one of that tribe throw down their weapons and bow. They get on their knees and they bow to him. You only guess why? Yes, they recognized the rod. Do you know what it was? It was the royal scepter of that king. He was in right standing with him. And when he lifted that up, they knew who owned it. And they bowed to the king that, su that supported him. And because of that, Stanley got all the way through Africa, cut in 50 covenants. And finally found Dr. Livingstone and says, ah, uh, Dr. Livingstone, I presume, in that very British, non-exciting way. And remained in history. When I told that story in, uh, in Uganda, they all recognized it. Every single one of them. It's like, yeah, we know. You see, we don't that much. But it is still stronger in some places. So this whole idea is still very strong. So they recognized Stanley Livingstone because that's where it happened. It's part of their history. It's part of our history because of Stanley Livingstone, but it's their history because of the other side. So it was interesting to actually experience that when I was in Uganda. Amen? That makes sense? Is this interesting stuff? Oh, good. Okay, come back, number seven. Come on. Come on. Break's over. Get back to work. You little Lennonite, you. <laughs> These Lennonites are all the same. You've got to get them going. Oops, who's doing it again to me? Turn your mobile phones off, please. All right. Number seven, step seven. Oh, yeah. All right. We now give the covenant terms. Again, we're still in this position. Of course, we're doing this, okay? So you've got to get, get the picture. All right. So we're going to now give the covenant terms. So before the witnesses, which is you, uh, we now uh, speak out the covenant terms. Now I want you to now again come back to this picture that I am the most wealthiest, most powerful king. He's not. This is what I say to him in the terms of this covenant. <coughs> I am saying, Sean, all my assets are yours. 
Okay? You want to come into covenant with me? Can you say that? Think of your assets. Now, I'm a poor evangelist. I don't have any. And you're going to come into a covenant with me? Aren't you? I need a new boat. I need a new house. I need a new thing. Okay? You, what I'm saying to him is, all my assets are yours. All my money. All my money is yours. See, we can't do that today, can we? Oh, no, no. We have a concept called sharing and fairness. You know, if I put five marbles in, then it's only fair that you put the same five in. But if, if, if you put six marbles in and I put five marbles in, that's not fair, so I owe you a marble. And that's why we kill each other. See, Jesus never taught us to share anything. Sorry to disappoint you. Sharing is not the way of God. Sharing will always cause problems. Oh, well, I've shared more than you. You've only shared this much, but I've shared that much. That's not fair. We gave two houses, you only gave one house. All that kind of stuff. That's sharing. It doesn't work. The principle is giving. Give that you may receive, not share. Give. Okay, this will make sense in a moment. You'll see it. But I had a, a friend of mine who was an accountant, and he was big on sharing as a Christian. I said, no, 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 no. But I couldn't get him to understand the principle. So I said, Lord, give me a way to explain this to an accountant. Okay? I'm an artist. Okay, I don't have a problem. I can get concepts. This guy can't. He's got a... You know? So how do I explain it to him? And... Um, Except for Livy. <laughs> She's squirming over there. <laughs> anyway, I got this idea and I went back to him and I said, and this is the idea, two people had 100% each. That's important. That doesn't mean how much, 100%. So he's only got, say, five horses and I've got 50. It's his 100%, my 100%. Okay, good. Percent. Percentum ratio. Okay. Two people at 100% each. And they were only concerned about giving everything they had to each other. That was their only concern, is to give everything they had to the other person. Then after doing so, they both had 200%. And this guy turned around to me and says, you can only have 100% of anything. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get him doing your books when he gets up there, Lord. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him do the accounting. Oh, yeah, sheep, goats. Anyway, so, okay. So what I'm saying to him is, Sean, all of my assets are yours. All of my money is yours. All of my property is yours. All of my possessions, they're all yours, Sean. Do you think he's a happy little Vegemite? Yes, he is. Woo, he's just got lottery. Okay, one Powerball, and you've got it. Okay, so he's got the Powerball. So this is in inheritance, you see. He's coming in to his inheritance. Yes? Good. No, why? Because he deserves it? No, because I am giving it to him. We are freely entering into this. And it's freely done and freely given and freely received. Okay? So you do not have to ask me, Sean, anymore. You just come and you just get it. What's mine is yours. And if I die, Sean... All my children are yours by adoption. This is very important. All my children are yours by adoption. I want you to stop here. You are adopted. Okay? In the blood. Now, when you read Ephesians and that, that might not make sense. But you see, if I die, he gets my children by adoption. Do I have a blood covenant with him? Yes. Now, we're not family genealogy, we are blood by covenant, so therefore my children equally inherit everything because he adopts them as his own by the blood. Does that make sense? So you are redeemed by the blood and adopted by the blood, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Okay, good. I'm ahead of my track here, but I know it's going through your mind, so I thought I'd answer a couple of things as I go along. Is this making sense? Is it not boring you? Okay, praise the Lord. 
Okay, so my children are yours by adoption. Now, this means that you are responsible for my family. Okay? But, now oh, here's the but. Do you know how you can tell the difference between the, sh the sheep and the goats? You know the Lord's going to separate the sheep from the goats at the end of time? Do you know how you tell the difference? Yeah. See, the sheep, if the Lord asks them to do anything, they go, they just do it, they go, bye-bye, and do it. But the goats say, yes, but. I'll leave that with you. It's called ex reasonitis. They've always got a reason not to do it, all right? All right. But all at the same time, you are also responsible for my liabilities. Ah, I don't like that one, eh? All right, let's have a look at your accounts, mate. You might be offering me all of this, but how much debt you got? All right. All right. So you're also responsible for my liabilities. Now, if I ever have any financial trouble, I don't have to ask you for any money. All I've got to do is say, hey, Sean, where's our bank card? Okay? Now, before witnesses, we read off the list. And I want you to get this, and it's got to be the truth, of all of our assets and liabilities. So what do you think might happen if I hide a couple of things? Think about it. We're, he's being honest with me. He's listing off all his liabilities and assets, and I hide a couple of assets. Right. What am I going to end up? I'm going to end up like a carcass. Is he a savage? No, he is a just man. I'm the savage. Do you understand? All right, good. So this might make sense of you of Ananias and Sapphira. Have you heard of them? All right? They sold all their property and assets to give money into the community. When they turned up to Paul, and Paul says, is that it all? And they said yes, but they didn't. They kept some of it. And then Ananias drops dead. And then his wife comes in, when I came him out, she's, she lies to the Holy Spirit again, she drops dead. They had a covenant. Be careful, don't lie to the Holy Spirit, you could end up dead. Yeah, of course I'm a Christian, okay? Right, all right, yeah. All right. I'm just not a mamby pammy huggy wuggy flower pow, hey man, Jesus, right? Okay. So right now, we're just saying that's our thing. So therefore... We now then, after we listed off all of our liabilities and assets, we now speak the terms of the blessings for keeping this covenant and the curses for breaking it. Okay? This is where this comes in. We speak out the blessings for keeping it and the curses for breaking it. Okay? Is that good? So it's pretty clear you've all witnessed it. But notice there is a blessing for keeping the curse for breaking. Remember I've said, Sean, if I ever break any part of this covenant, treat me like this carcass. Split me down the middle and throw me to the vultures. May God do this to me. Not just you. May God do this to me. Okay? If I break this. <coughs> okay? So, now the next step is step eight. We now have a memorial meal. Okay? So to complete the covenant terms and the union... We now, in place of the animal and the blood, guess what? We bring in, to, re to represent that, to substitute for that, we bring in bread and wine. Okay? This is the ancient ritual, bread and wine. Now, in Genesis 49.11, the uh, wine is referred to as the blood of, of the grape. Okay? Wine is referred to as the blood of the grape. And so the grape is used, which is also crushed to make the wine, is used as the substitute for our blood and the blood of the animal. We're not supposed to drink the blood of animals according to God, so you can't do that. All right? The only time, and it, because that's kosher or halal, you have to remove the blood. Because the life, you can't eat the blood. See, if you drink the blood or eat the blood of an animal, that's why people drink blood of their enemies and things like that. You know, the old Dracula thing. is to become into a oneness by the blood. It's a covenant thing. Okay? So, you know, God doesn't want you to be in covenant with an animal, so do not eat the blood. <laughs> Does that make sense? 
do not eat or drink the blood of an animal because you come into covenant with it. That's the premise upon which it's done, okay? Um, and so it represents our own lifeblood. The wine represents our own lifeblood. The bread represents our flesh. Okay, so we clean that away and now we're going to have a memorial meal. What's the memorial meal in a wedding? The reception. Don't you have cake and food and share the wine? Okay, same thing, okay? It all comes from here. So now we take the loaf of bread. Sean and I are sitting there, we take the loaf of bread, and then we break it in two. Okay, so he breaks it in half, okay? Then we feed it to each other. So he gives, he says, now take this, <laughs> break it, take this, and eat. <laughs> okay, you've heard that before? Good, that's where it comes from, all right? So he gives me the bread. I put the bread, give him the bread, he gives the bread to me, right? All right, good, good. See, it's, it is. Okay. So this is where you practice being a Catholic in the Hebrew ritual. Okay. Oh, I'll put it on the hand, it's easier. All right, okay. So what you do is you feed it into him. Now, when he gives me the bread, Right, and I give him the bread, we feed it to each other. What we're saying, and this is, the words are very important, this bread is symbolic of my body. Symbolic of my body. But I am putting it into you. Okay? The bread represents us, the flesh. We break it, too, we've broken the carcass, we now break the bread. You notice in the Mass, Good. It's to do with the carcass. Good. You've got it. Right. Then comes the wine, the blood. Okay. So the Eucharist is broken in two. Okay. Right. Now. So we, we now break that in two and feed it to each other. Okay. And he is saying, this is, this is symbolic of my flesh and it's coming into you and we're becoming one flesh. One body. Okay. Then we uh, serve the wine, as we said earlier. And then I take the wine, he takes the wine, and we're saying, this wine is symbolic of my life's blood, which, I am, which is now your blood. So I am saying, you are in me and I in you. So as we take the wine and drink, we're coming into communion, and what I'm saying is, I am in you and you are in me. We are now one together in a new nature. Does all this reflect on anything that you already know? And we haven't even got to the Bible yet? Okay, you can hear it all, can't you? All right? So this is, at this moment, symbolic. Okay? But it has profound meaning and depth. Because... We are not allowed to kill each other. We're not allowed to give sac human sacrifice. So there is a substitute sacrifice. Substitute is important. So the ram that is slain is the substitute for him and me. So the, the animal, which usually is a ram in, in a covenant ceremony, is the sacrifice. But it is an acceptable sacrifice that is wholly consumed, which is holocaustal, right? Because it represents us, substitute. Then, when because we cannot then come into covenant with the animal and drink that and eat that flesh, we now substitute the bread and wine as a symbol representing. So now we can enter into our new nature without breaking any law. Does that make sense? Good. So the last step is we now plant a memorial tree. Okay. So the memorial tree is a sign of the covenant to remember it by. So we do this by planting a tree that we have sprinkled with the blood of the animal. Okay. Um, you know, for those who don't know, that watching us with the King's Park, okay, uh, which is a very beautiful park just above the city, looking over the river for those who are watching. Okay, look on the internet, it's very beautiful. But in King's Park, there's an avenue leading in there with trees either side. And on the uh, trunks of the trees are plaques with the names of soldiers, yes, that have died in the wars. They've spilled blood. So why are they on a tree? 
because it's a memorial tree. Of the blood that was spilt, the sacrifice. You see? So it comes from this. Whenever we, you know, you'll see government establish a new project or some new building, they'll dig a hole and plant a tree. It's from this. It's a memorial tree. Okay? So that's where all of that comes from. It comes from this final step of a memorial to remember the covenant that was entered into. Okay? So in that sense, war memorials and things like that are all have their roots in this whole concept of blood and sacrifice. Okay? Which is why they're held as sacred. Not in the sense of God, but in the sense of, of sacrifice. Okay? Because, you see, I, in this covenant, I'm giving my life for this man. I've given it up for him. I'm already dead, but living for him. And so when this happens through, say, our nation or your nation, these people, knowingly or willingly or not, are actually become the willing sacrifice to save us. It's the cost of the blood of our redemption to protect us from the enemy that would destroy us. And so we can, this idea of blood covenant is so inherent in our nature as human, we can't avoid it, cannot avoid it. Um, remember being a little kid, long ago for me, not so long for you. Have you ever had a best friend? And, and they, you really got to be so best friends that you want to be so much best friends. You say, oh, we were so best friends forever and ever. We've got to do something to do this. So have you ever seen people, or maybe you've done it yourself, that have got a pin, pierced your finger or your thumb, right, and put them together, and you've gone, oh, we're going to be best friends forever and ever and ever. No one's going to separate us. Okay. Did anybody teach you to do that? Yeah. What did you do? Yeah. Yeah, you might not in America because you've got the blood brother thing, but in England we didn't have that because we don't have American Indians. But it was inherent in each culture, the instinct is to do something with blood. doesn't matter where it comes from, the instinct is the blood. We don't do it by exchanging push bikes. We do it by exchanging blood, okay? So the instinct is there. It's got to be sealed in blood. Does that make sense? We can't, this is so... Normal to us. You understand? And when we forget it, we lose so much of what keeps us safe. Okay? So you have to sacrifice. The blood has to be spilled to seal the friendship. Okay. So when we, what we're doing now, this is what becomes interesting. We now take a tree, which now becomes the memorial to the covenant which we have just shared. We now take, a, in, in this culture, and we can't do it in this part of the world, we take a hyssop stick. Hyssop is very common in that area of the world, and the hyssop stick has a hollow uh, branch, uh, um, stem. Okay? So we take, generally, a hyssop stick, we planted the tree, we now take the hyssop stick and go to the bloody animal. Okay, to the blood of the animal. We now take the blood of the animal onto the hesop stick and we splash it and sprinkle it onto the tree, onto the wood of the tree. What comes out of the hesop stick? Put blood and water onto the wood. Have you heard that before? Okay, so that is where that comes from. Um, the blood sprinkled tree along with the scar, will always be a testimony to our covenant. And now the ceremony is complete. So what do you think is your covenant tree, memorial tree? The cross. Good. You can now. You may, you may sit down. Actually, I think you better thank him, actually. That was really good. Oh. Now, I've got to tell you, children are also included in this covenant, including the unborn children. The unborn. Now, when we get this, we can start to look at, hmm, you know, abortion is quite a violation, but boy, a bit more when you get to this. Because the unborn children are included in the covenant. Why? Because they were in us when we cut it. 
What does that mean? They're in my seed. Okay? So that means all future generations of our seed is now blessed in this covenant as a perpetual inheritance. Okay? And so that means, of course, we, now this is where we found as Catholics and where, you know, the Jewish tradition was to impart the faith. Now, you know as parents, you're the first teachers of the faith. Where we fall down is because we're ignorant of our own faith and we'd rather get the school or someone else to teach them and they're teaching them to sit and do yoga at the moment. So be careful, parents. Okay? You are supposed to be the teachers of your children, not the Catholic Education Office or anybody else for that matter. Not even the government, my friends. All right? And their curriculums. You. Now, these children are in us. They're not yet born. So it's very important that Sean and myself keep the proper focus to our families on what took place on this day. So it is passed on accurately. Not with interpretation, not with opinion, but accurately. Why? It's to protect the other generations. Ten generations from now, if it's been watered down, will not get the full inheritance because it's a different contract, because it's been changed. So it has to be remain intact. This is what God appointed the Roman Catholic Church for, to keep the teaching intact. So it will not be changed and become another gospel. So the whole Judaic tradition held in Scripture is held intact. And there lies where the laws come in to hold it intact so it cannot change. So what would happen is we would bring up our families in it, but of course the children would have to choose for themselves. We can't make them. So what my responsibility and Sean's responsibility as parents is, is to teach the children about this covenant so that when they get to an age where they can choose for themselves, which average age is about 12, which is where confirmation stuff comes in, okay? Or 13, bar mitzvah. Good? All right? Now you're old enough to choose, but what are you going to choose? You, you have to be instructed in the covenant to make a proper choice. You cannot make a good choice if it's based on a false or unsound premise. So the premise has to be correct in order to make a proper choice. Yes? So you don't have to excuse this world for not compromising your faith. Otherwise they can't make a proper choice if you compromise it. And so then they can make a choice for themselves. Not you. For themselves. If we don't do that, they're not going to make a proper choice. But they then enter in freely. That's the bar mitzvah in Judeo tradition. Confirmation in ours. Okay? But we will see later where the covenant scar comes in at eight days old. Eight days old. A child is given a covenant scar. And then people say to me, why are you getting your children baptized? They're too young. A Jew was entering this covenant with a scar at eight days old. Jesus did. But at 13, when they're old enough, when brought up in the teachings of the covenant, they say, I accept this for myself, and then they're adopted into the family and take on the full roles of men. That's the bar mitzvah, is the adoption into the full role and stature of the inheritance. Does that make sense? So these nine steps is what they would take. Now, we are going to see them in the Bible. <laughs>